I would like to welcome today our guest on today's episode, Mike Mouslem, partner at Explorer Research with offices in Toronto and Chicago. So at Explorer Research, Mike leads the VR methodology, so virtual reality, in tandem with our partner ReadySet. What was once an expensive technology has now been built into an affordable subscription-based model with pre-built environments. So delivering that near real-life experience to research participants, which we all love, uh, the reliability of these results are from the immersive experiences, meaning that the shopper in sight actually commands more of a voice at the table. So when brands consider growth and innovation, this is definitely a tool they should consider. So projects span from everything from launch strategy to category development, from price modeling to shoppers displays and more. So really exciting stuff. Welcome to the show today, Mike. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. No problem. So today we're actually going to dive into more of a background around behavioral research, maybe a little bit around shopper insights. So my experience in terms of shopper research, you know, it almost always seems to have a bit of a healthy dose of qualitative exploration. So things like in-depth interviews, uh, focus groups, mystery shopping, ethnography, you know, all those innovative methods that I'm sure we'll discuss today, but, you know, market researchers in behavioral science are really uh, quite privy to. So maybe before we dive in, I forgot to introduce myself. So I am Sharde Torgerson, the creative and digital strategist here at Incitrix Research in Saskatoon, Canada, and I am the host for season three at Stories of Market Research, the Incitrix podcast. So, I mean, I kind of give you a bit of an intro there talking about leading uh, virtual reality methods at Explorer Research, but maybe for our listeners, feel free to maybe tell us a little bit more about your background, uh, perhaps your role at Explorer Research a little bit further in your own words. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a partner uh, at Explorer Research. Uh, we're a behavioral research company. So we focus on both what people say as well as how they actually behave in, uh, in different environments. And so we're very focused on that element. Uh, personally within uh, Explorer, uh, I do head up the client service team and I also, I'm very focused on uh, new technologies and new technology partnerships. Um, one of those being VR, which I think you mentioned just a second ago. Uh, so yeah, with our partner ReadySet Technologies, we're very focused on delivering super high fidelity VR uh, environments for testing purposes. So um, really, really great stuff from, from that company uh, as well. Uh, personally, uh, in terms of my history, um, uh, I've kind of always been in that Shopper Insights category management realm. Uh, so prior to Explorer, um, I was at uh, Kantar, Kraft, PepsiCo, uh, and Nielsen as well. Pretty big names to talk about when it comes to shopper research. I know they're definitely, uh, you know, brands that are best in class. So, I mean, I love that we're kind of talking about all things, maybe shopper research, but, you know, for our listeners, as we dive in, what do we really mean when we say, you know, the term shopper insights? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, when we talk about shopper insights, we're really talking about an understanding of that full shopper journey. Um, the who, what, when, where, why um, across that entire journey. Now, some of those are obvious. You know, we think about the conscious um, elements of a purchase process. I'm going to choose this retailer over that retailer or this category over that or this product over that. And yes, that's a part of it. But there are also a number of subconscious decisions that we're, we're making constantly along that journey. So things that we don't even realize we're making, those decisions that we don't even realize we're making. And really understanding that in conjunction with so, some of those conscious pieces helps us really understand um, what that um, what that full continuum uh, looks like. So that sounds a lot maybe similar to consumer insights. Am I wrong? Is there a difference between the two consumer insights and then shopper insights? And maybe if so, what are the types of differences? Yeah, yes, there's a difference. Um, <laughs> I hesitate to say that. And I'll tell ah, you fair why. enough, fair enough. So uh, yes, there's a difference. I mean, fundamentally, um, shopper objectives and methodologies are different from, from more of the consumer pieces. Um, there's different uh, mindsets and occasions when we talk about shoppers versus consumers. Um, if I, even within a shopper mindset, you may, I could be in more of a discovery type of mindset, considered, it could be a grab and go type of a situation, it could be more impulsive. And all of those are very different from some of those consumption occasions. They can be very similar for certain categories, but often they're quite different. Even the shopper or the consumer themselves 
could be completely different people depending on what you're talking about. Um, so really when we talk about it, yes, there fundamentally there are differences, but I mentioned that I hesitate to say so. Um, that's because I think partially from you know previous experiences where it has been somewhat of a, you know, I'm Shopper Insights, you're Consumer Insights, let's stay apart and you do your thing. And, you know, I just fundamentally, there's, it's just not the right way to do things. I think, you know, companies and people are coming around to that now where it really is about understanding the full robust learning agenda for a product, a brand, a category, a retailer, et cetera. And that's why I really think they have to be considered uh, kind of t- together in tandem. That makes sense. Oh, I love that. And I couldn't agree more. And often I think there's a lot of similar insights that can come from both. Um, even maybe if the public, you know, assumption sometimes is that shopper insights, you know, is a little bit more tactical, but I, I love that ex- explanation about them really kind of being tandem to one another. But what maybe are some types of Intel then that businesses can learn while using that type of path to purchase? Yeah, for sure. Um, all sorts of things. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know what, um, if, if we focus on something like P2P research specifically, uh, like I said, there's, there's the elements that we're all aware of, channel choice and the conscious decisions that we make. There are more of those subconscious triggers and barriers. And, you know, there's a role for, for quant, there's a role for qual within that exploration and that understanding. Um, but really, when you start to uncover those key touch points along that path to purchase, you start to understand some of those pre-store uh, triggers, opportunities, barriers, um, influencers, all of those elements, those key touch points that have the largest impact at a category or retailer level. And then in-store, how are people navigating? How are they actually navigating to that department of choice? Um, how are they actually choosing within a particular aisle? What are the ideal adjacencies? What does the ideal planogram look like? What does the ideal package look like? The signage components. All of those feed into this larger view around what those key opportunities are versus other categories, what the difference, differences are between online and perhaps brick and mortar, um, specific channel or retailer opportunities, category opportunities, you name it. There's so much there. And that understanding helps us as an industry and as a client team really understand what are the right products, the right uh, situations, the right uh, experiences to design and what's really desired by that, by that shopper base. Absolutely. Yet the shopper experience is definitely changing. I think we can both kind of attest to that. Is there maybe an example perhaps where, um, you know, an assumption about a shopper behavior was challenged after testing it? I don't know if you've worked even in a recent, uh, on a recent project where maybe you kind of had that aha moment, or even maybe we're just seeing something, uh, you know, within the, the trends of behaviors where, you know, maybe that assumption was challenged after the fact. There are tons of, <laughs> of examples, uh, not many that I can share, but I, I will say that, um, you know, what, what jumps the, to the top of the list for me, I think, is, is packaging research. Because, uh, you know, that's, that's an area where, and I am thinking about a couple of key projects here, but like, you know, um, a particular claim that can be made by a brand team or a category team. Uh, and really the eagerness of the internal team to put that on the package and on the signage and everywhere. And I think that sometimes uh, as, as uh, you know, being very close to these brands and these products and these categories, we start to kind of believe ourselves that, you know, it's going to change everything about how people shop the category. And, you know, people are going to search for this claim or this element or this dimension uh, that wasn't there previously, but it's going to change everything. And, you know, if you take a test versus control scenario, I am thinking about a VR study in this instance, um, where this claim was kind of brought to all the products in the category. And I think the expectations were high. Um, but, you know, as you think about that, and you actually look at the test versus control scenarios, you realize that when shoppers are there, it's a different mindset. That's not kind of what they're looking for. That's not what they've been trained to look for. In fact, if I remember correctly, for some of these, it's like it's one to 2% a noticeability for some of these newer claims that we're trying to bring to market. And it's not really shocking from a shopper perspective because 
one, they're very, it's, it's, a, it's a very trained behavior for a lot of these categories. And two, it's different from, you know, I think we often want to put shopper experiences in the context of like concept tests almost, where it's perfection. And we want to try and include every single piece of information possible. And that's often not the shopper reality. Um, because those decisions in the retail environment are being made in seconds. And that's from awareness to actual decisions. Um, and so you have to be very, be very focused in, in the communication and the hierarchy of that communication on package, in aisle. Uh, and that even applies to things like planograms um, within the actual um, uh, shopping environment. Hmm. Yet the the path to purchase is no longer linear, right? And it's not to say maybe even in the past it ever was, but I I really do think that more than ever, uh, touch points are changing how people really engage with a lot of this stuff. So, you know, even at Incitrix ourselves, we do shopper research. Uh, we are we worked in several industries, everything from gaming to retail. A lot of the you know same things that you're saying really do come up in a lot of the projects we do as well which is quite interesting um and then too one of the golden rules i think we follow is that within this type of research you have to kind of think like a shopper because to your point uh their their behaviors they're the user at the end of the day and we're, we're busy thinking like a researcher we're putting that cap on and we're really trying to get those answers but what are some maybe and maybe we kind of touched on them a little bit but what are those behavior insight perspectives that may uh you know these brands might need to consider when approaching this type of method yeah for sure um, you know, I think when you're when you're looking at it from a shopper perspective, um, there are some general rules that apply across the board. Um, you know, less is more. When you think about packaging, you know, in the rule of three, we call it the rule of three, where it's you know a maximum of three elements on the package that you need to prioritize uh, in order for those shoppers to notice. Because again, you're talking about split seconds when people are making decisions, noticing things. What do you need to communicate in terms of your brand category hierarchy uh, to be most meaningful and, and impact conversion in that, in that, in that moment. Uh, things like signage applies to signage as well. Uh, but even in the case of signage, you know, how many times have we seen things in retail environments where, you know, an offer is trying to be communicated, but it's like three sentences long, <laughs> uh, which, which simply is not um, something that, you know, people are likely to read. Really, we're talking three to five words. That's that's what's going to stick out. So, um, how do you actually impact that and and make those changes um, in in that environment? Now, I think it it does depend. There is a nuance here, and it does depend on the type of category you're talking about. Uh, I mentioned the shopper mindsets earlier on. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about more of a discovery based category, more of a considered category where that mindset is predominant when someone is shopping, um, a little more information is fine, um, in the right places. Um, and again, that doesn't all have to live on the package, um, especially with some of those products in, in those types of categories. Um, but it's a different story when you talk about more impulsive or grab and go categories where really efficiency is key. Uh, and that that's that's the play. So I think in summary, simplicity is key when you think about uh, shopper insights or shopper behavior. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And I bet uh, for marketers, they can probably relate out there. It's definitely maybe a lot harder said than done. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, and I couldn't agree more. I think it's a, it's a constant struggle on the marketer end to really uh, maintain that uh, quick, short, and sweet um, you know, marketing campaign. But yeah, you ring really true. So I, I think, yeah, the shopper insights aspect to it must really support marketers like me who you know would really uh, be looking for that kind of help uh, to be able to determine then again what these shoppers are looking for because I even think you know we keep talking about the shift and the change in the recent years and it's for obvious reasons it's over you know pretty apparent circumstances right so I mean even the certain types of methodologies we've been using in, in the past or prior to 2020 um, a lot of on the ground research methods you know we, we used to run in fairly uncontrolled environments but there weren't a lot of barriers um you know the, the physical environments were accessible uh the participants were accessible uh, and then you know the projects were fairly easy to manage on that aspect but what is it like you know when we're employing say 
these types of methods where the physical environment isn't accessible? Is there anything that businesses can be doing, um, you know, to ensure that they're meeting the project demands, even if, you know, those barriers are kind of in the way? Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are multiple ways to do something uh, and the same thing. Um, some are better than others, depending on the objectives of a particular study. Um, I would say, you know, if you're thinking about natural behavior and you simply want to understand natural behavior within a retail environment, um, nothing's going to be better than the real thing. Um, so, you know, you're, you're on the ground, you're, you're watching it in real time. Uh, that can be brick and mortar. It can be online as well, if there's something uh, that's more relevant in that realm. But the point is, you're close to the action. You're seeing it as it's actually happening. And there's merit to that. Um, from that, you can learn uh, in the purest way possible, and you can build some hypotheses, some options, some testing scenarios. Um, there are situations where you know it's you don't want to be in the real retail, real retail environment, or you can't be. I think we've all kind of seen that recently. And for those, that's that's why you know we strive to get as close to the real thing as possible, and we're all about trying to get as immersive as possible. So whether that's virtual reality, which is CLT or online, whatever it may be, or immersive 360 qualitative, where you're actually trying to transport yourself into that um, retail environment and get as close to, to as close as possible to what it would actually be like. Now, there are situations where if you do have a test versus control environment, you probably don't want to be in the real retail environment. You want to control for all of the, the, the different elements and you want to have a very comparable cell versus cell lead. Uh, and for those reasons, you know, CLT testing or virtual reality, even online, uh, may be a perfect solution where you're, you're, you're hitting on the realism as much as you possibly can, but you're also balancing that with the research rigor. What is CLT testing? Just to elaborate a little bit further for our listeners. Yeah, for sure. Uh, central location testing. So uh, as an example, um, if you think about um, a virtual reality in the context of central location testing, um, think of, you know, three, four, ten locations um, simultaneously uh, across either the U.S. or Canada um with uh, headsets in each of those different facilities eye tracking built in respondents are pre-recruited for uh for a certain amount of time over a quantitative sample and they get the full immersive experience um, of what that environment could be could be so you get the quant sample um via central location testing cool that sounds really neat and i mean as you mentioned these types of technologies are becoming a lot more i mean for lack of a better term maybe mainstream like people are becoming more aware of them uh even you know vr even within the last year you have things like augmented reality of meta the metaverse kind of coming into play uh you know vr seems to be something that people are talking more of you know, doing regular things like hanging out with friends, playing video games, um, learning about other areas that they're not from. So I think it's cool too, that we're also talking about it from the perspective of trying to understand attitudes in the market research context, whether, you know, we're doing a shopper research or things like even at Incitrix, we use uh, eye tracking methodologies to perform ad tracking techniques or, um, you know, just um, ad sentiment is another one. So just uh, seeing uh, how a person may engage with an advertisement if they find it, you know, funny or if it's a really sensitive ad, you know, how they may react at certain uh, points of the, the advertisement. So it's quite interesting to, to see a lot of these new technologies uh, become a really kind of new, innovative, uh, immersive way to be doing research. So this is another really key example, I think. And if I may, uh, VR, I guess, is a research methodology. Um, eye tracking is another one, is is an interesting concept. But what might a project look like? Like, we were kind of talking about it, but maybe we'll expand a little bit further. Maybe we might use a hypothetical, um, like, uh, you know, for instance, the perspective of maybe a grocery store customer who might really care about where their products being sourced from. So, you know, maybe it's not so much the location that they care about, but that going back to that product design. So how maybe would we, you know, employ one of these immersive uh, methodologies to try to support that? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, again, there's there's a hundred different ways you could possibly <laughs> design something for this. That's a good thing, um, I think. That's an awesome thing. So <laughs> right, and I mean, there's no wrong way. It's uh, there are probably preferred methods based on unique objectives, but um, but if we think about it specifically in the context of VR, just for an illustration, um, you know, if you think about it as you know, take locally sourced um, or organic or something along those lines. Um, you have a test uh, and a control scenario. Your control scenario in a produce section, let's say, involves some signage that may be there today um, and, you know, something on the package, which is, you know, current. Uh, test scenario, you have, you know, claim around locally grown or organic or whatever it may be on some signage. In the produce section, you have uh, some some kind of a claim on the package as well. We could start people, you know, quantitatively. This could be a qualitative exercise as well, but think of it quantitatively for the uh, for argument's sake. Um, you know, start at the, uh, at the at the front of the produce section. Allow them to complete their shop uh, naturally. Again, eye tracking is built in, so we understand exactly what they're looking at. And from that, even test versus control, you can really start to understand well. One, are they noticing the test signage to a greater degree via the eye tracking from the uh, from either the webcam or the uh, the um, uh, headset itself? Um, have you increased foot traffic via breadcrumb uh, analysis that we have built in? So does that increase foot traffic because of that uh, test scenario? What specific words or images on the signage or the package are they noticing that on the package the claim? Um, or what, what specifically is standing out? And ultimately, did it convert to a greater degree um, as a result of that uh, communication? So you can get some pretty, pretty meaningful insights, and that's just the behavioral component. Um, and of course, that's always coupled with, uh, with a survey component where we can consciously understand uh, people's perspectives as well, bringing the two together. I love that. I think that's really important to keep in mind is that while a lot of, you know, shopper insight, shopper research is really driven by, you know, qualitative methodologies, there is the ability to, you know, take it one step further if you really would like and apply that quantitative survey and, and dive a little bit deeper if you'd like. But, um, you know, again, we keep kind of talking around motives and behaviors and, and, and those shopper behaviors, again, uh, are, we're seeing them change so drastically that for even like, I, I use myself as an example, because, you know, as a marketer, we're, we're really kind of in the middle of the mix and really trying to figure things out. And, and every day seems like a new, you know, uh, business problem, which is great. But I also think, you know, stuff like uh, shopper insights can help give, you know, sales metrics, uh, proper sales metrics to marketers and really understand, you know, maybe at the end of the day, why the consumer is going to purchase the product. Uh, I think even in Canada, we can agree that agribusiness is really big. So the fact that we're kind of talking about these, uh, you know, locally sourced or these types of, um, you know, insights are really important to, to folks in agri, uh, agribusiness. But you know, as an example of an industry where I think shopper emotions, attitudes and behaviors, you know, really comes from understanding the motive. Agribusiness is probably a good one. Um, even in our independent research, we're seeing that motive is often coming from how a product is sourced uh, or what it's made of. But I think this type of shopper in um, sentiment really does lead to how businesses, we're kind of talking about it, shelf products, um, market promotions, and, and really try to give the clarity behind the product. So I'm wondering, Mike, how are maybe shopper insights helping improve, you know, the customer loyalty for brands or, or maybe more of a product design? Uh, and why is maybe behavioral science a little bit more important than ever to maybe ensure that these products are getting in front of the, the right people? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you mentioned things like uh, where it's sourced, how it's sourced, those elements. Um, if we kind of latch on to that for a second, um, you know, if you, again, you take the produce example, just because just it's obvious, um, but you know, someone is in that section and right off the bat, I mean, there's a segment of the shopper base where where it's sourced, how it's sourced is going to be incredibly important for those people today. Um, that's not necessarily the majority of the shoppers, depending on the retail uh, situation, the banner, the channel, etc. cetera. Um, so there's also a mainstream consumer where they may see something like that. And, you know, that, um, that, um, 
um, certification justifies a, justifies a higher price point typically. And they would look at that and say, perhaps, no, it's not worth it. Um, so then you think about yourself and you say, well, how, 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 do, we, how do we take this situation? Uh, and this is where really the Shopper Insights piece comes into mind, because there may be a better way that is more meaningful for that mainstream shopper to internalize that message of, of sourcing, of how it's made, of the quality ingredients. And that could be, it, to your point, in more of an emotional form. You know, it's better for my family. It's healthier for my kids. Uh, it tastes better. It's fresher. It's, it's, a, it's a more unique product for these reasons. So health benefits, all of those elements. Um, and if you bring it home for that mainstream consumer, you know, it's, a, it's sourced this way, and therefore, here are the outputs from that. So it's the why that comes out, out of that, which I think for some shoppers, in an instance, may actually hit home more than the, um, you know, uh, the sourcing message itself. So it's an output of it, and therefore, it may actually justify the price point over time. So my point, I think, is that doing a little bit of research um, can help to really understand different ways that are meaningful for more than perhaps the, the most obvious shopper base in, in the situation. Yeah, I think price point is a really fun example of that. And um, if if I'm thinking of a recent campaign or even a recent um uh, it's been going on for quite a while in terms of marketing products, but what comes to mind is the A&W, um, you know, plant-based products or, yeah, just the way that they source certain types of beef and, you know, even how with within, a, I think it was a six month, uh, you know, time frame where, you know, the campaign came out and it slowly became a huge position point for a lot of the industry, both for the good and for the bad. Um, and arguably, they, they still really do a, a strong campaign um, in terms of how they they show this but I think it's almost the flip side of what you're saying where it's almost they need to justify the lower price point but um, but they're doing it in a really interesting way to kind of show how they uh, source their food so interesting concepts there but it, it actually kind of leads me maybe into my last point um i think often because you know we're even talking about a lot of big box brands using this type of research but i mean i i'm i'm from a smaller firm we're a boutique firm so i i don't think we're any less of a brand to actually be using this type of um you know methodology but maybe for those listening uh, you know, that don't say have the same kind of firepower as maybe craft. Uh, you know, what what is the type of message do we want to send maybe those brands about Shopper Insights and, and say, you know, the, rele the relevancy is far more greater, I think, than people are aware and far more greater than just consumer manufacturing and big box brands actually being the only ones to utilize this. So. Yeah, I hear you. Um... I think there is probably a bit of a history there where, you know, there's an association with the larger brands, the larger retailers, et cetera, in the context of shopper insights. And it doesn't need to be that way. Um, you know, if you really, if you think about shopper insights, they exist everywhere. Um, you know, the purest form of shopper insights could be absolutely free, just standing in the, in the actual environment, observing people as they, as they actually, uh, complete their shopping experience or their experience or whatever it may be. Um, and, and, and that can be quite meaningful um, often. So even if the, the budgets aren't there, um, you can still get to very meaningful uh, insights. And like I said before, I think, I think you know, there are a lot of really forward thinking um, methodologies out there. We talk about VR, we talk about AR, we talk about you know, immersive environments and all that kind of stuff. And Yes, that's an advanced way of thinking about some of these elements, but it's not the only way to get answers. There are tons of ways to get answers. Um, and so, you know, being a little bit open, I think as an industry, we're very focused on what's the perfect solution for this. And the perfect solution doesn't exist, but, um, you know, getting close enough to make some educated decisions about your business um, is the goal. And really anyone can do that because the shopper insights are there. Um, you just have to have to look. 
I think that should be a qualitative slogan. The no, no perfect solution ever exists, but just give it a shot. I promise you'll get something out of it. Like, I, I love that. But it, it's so true. And I, I like that you mentioned, too, that even, you know, being an observer in your own, uh, you know, so your own brick and mortar, you own a small business and spending time observing how maybe that consumer transaction is happening or how you may be segmenting your your marketing information. Like how how do people even want to be, you know, engaged with or, or got a hold of if you have, you know, certain types of uh, subscription e-commerce? Like there's so many things that can be kind of brought to light just from even, you know, smaller uh, scaled, uh, even uh, self-employed or independent research projects that we can be doing ourselves. But um, yeah, I think that's all great information as well. Is there anything maybe you would like to add on top of that? I know we kind of went a bit of a full circle, uh, really trying to dive into Shopper Insights, but I'd, I'd love to leave the floor open to you, Mike. Yeah, no, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I think that really, the, the thing that really sticks with me here when we talk about any of these elements is, one, when we talk about a Shopper perspective, it's, it's you know, simple is often better. And I, I do think that, um, collectively as an industry, we, we're so excited to talk about all the benefits of everything and, and they, they absolutely do exist, but there's a, there's a time and a place for all that information and really trying to lay that out in the best way possible is the challenge. Um, and that's, that's how we aid the shopper experience. You know, that's how you aid, um, the, the exploration and discovery of new products. Um, whether you're talking about, you know, groceries or cars or whatever it may be. Um, and then, you know, the other piece here is, I think we've already just mentioned it around, like, you know, there's, there's no perfect solution. So some insights um, in order to make a educated business decision, uh, it's, it's, it's better than nothing. And, and uh, there, there's a great way to do, uh, or there are numerous great ways to do uh, the same uh, or achieve the same results. And I think it's important to mention, too, that even custom research doesn't take the same length as it may, you know, have a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, a decade. Uh, the same kind of shopper research that was done, say, around mystery shopping, focus groups, um, in-depth interviews, even even that whole world of qualitative methodologies changed. And I do think a lot of businesses are providing really great ways to support brands to be able to, to come up with a great shopper uh, research project where... Uh, the right solution is being employed that these uh, um, insights agencies are working with brands to ensure that, you know, we're, we're using a methodology that actually meets their problem and, and going the extra mile. And I really do think that, uh, you know, folks that explore research such as yourself are really showing, you know, there is growth and innovation uh, even within these uh, more modern type of qualitative methods. And, and it's crazy what can happen in a year. And I think, uh, I can't wait to see, you know, what will happen in the next year for you guys. So I thank you so much for coming on the show today. I think Shopper Insights is something that we're all kind of paying attention to uh, in the industry. I think you guys are very much ahead of the curve in what you guys are doing. So look forward to kind of paying attention to that. And yeah, thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me and uh, really great speaking with you.